Just before we start, two unconnected things. First, it's very nice to see Mr. Edley in the front row. Uh, and secondly, uh, as you will no doubt know, uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Woolley, has acted for almost every possible publisher in the course of his career at the bar. Uh, and that does include uh, these defendants, I think on one occasion about 20 years ago. Uh, we mention it, we don't think that matters at all, uh, but if either of you do, you should say so now. No, my Lord. No objection. Yes, Ms. Uh, may I please, Your Lordships, I appear uh, together with Ms. Sherval uh, on behalf of the appellant claimant in these proceedings. Uh, my learned friend, Mr. Ernie C.C., appears on behalf of the respondent defendant. Uh, the parties have filed a core bundle and supplemental bundle for the purposes of the appeal, uh, which uh, I understand uh, you have received, uh, and also a bundle of authorities. Uh, with the permission of the court, there are two very small uh, additions uh, to that bundle that we uh, wish to make. Um, the first is um, to add uh, to the uh, uh, to the extract um, from the Defamation Act, uh, the the Section Eight of the Defamation Act. In fact, I don't think there's any other part of it in the authorities bundle. But if this could go in tab one, uh, we would be grateful. Uh, and then my learned friend noticed uh, that missing from the um, recast Brussels regulation uh, was part of the recital. Um, so that's just added to be added in for completeness. Well, we've got sections 12 and 13 of the defamation act. All oh, right, if it could in go in, two. in just before those in tab two, then I'd be grateful. Uh, Sorry, right. I was going to say I've got an electronic bundle, but frankly, I can. The extra page of recital should go into uh, tab six of the authority. Thank you. In addition, uh, my lords, my learned friend has filed a supplemental skeleton, uh, which he seeks permission to rely on. Uh, if it helps to short circuit matters, the claimant has no objection to that. Thank you. Uh, the claimant appeals uh, with the permission of Lord Justice Arnold against parts of an order of Mrs. Justice Tipple, dated the 27th of May uh, 2021, um, in which the judge uh, did the following. Uh, first declared that pursuant to uh, Civil Procedure Rule 11, the court has no jurisdiction to hear and determine the claimant's claim for injunctive relief, preventing publication in this jurisdiction of online statements. Uh, and similarly, has no jurisdiction to make an order pursuant to Section 12 of the Defamation Act 2013, uh, which uh, are referred to respectively as the Internet Injunction Order and the Internet Section 12 Order. Uh, she ordered at paragraph 1, um, accordingly, that the claim for an Internet Injunction Order and an Internet Section 12 Order uh, be struck out, uh, and ordered at paragraph 5 that the claimant shall pay the defendant's costs of that application. There is no cross appeal, uh, although the defendant has, out of an abundance of caution, as it puts it, filed a respondent's notice at seeking to uphold the judge's order on one additional ground to the extent uh, that that is not covered um, in the judgment. Um, my Lord, before I proceed any further, um, I plan to take matters as follows. First, uh, to give uh, what I'm trying, what I will try to do, uh, is not to repeat what's in my skeleton argument because. Of course, uh, your Lordships will already have read and have the benefit of that. Um, I wish to um, give first a brief overview of the position and effect uh, of that ruling uh, for these proceedings and this claimant. Um, but then I wish to say a little bit uh, about the parties and about the action um, before coming to deal substantively with the ground. Uh, so that is how I'm uh, proposing to take this. Um, by way of overview, um, the effect of the decision below is that in the event that the claimant's claims succeed, that is, the court finds as a fact uh, that each publication complained of has caused or is likely to cause serious harm to his reputation in this jurisdiction, and there is no defence, 
made out. So uh, there is no defence at the moment, but let us assume for present purposes, no substantial truth defence is made out under Section 2, uh, no public interest defence made out under Section 4. And even in those circumstances, uh, the court will not be able to make any order restraining online publication here uh, or requiring the defendant to publish on a website or web page accessible to persons within this jurisdiction a summary uh, of the judgment made against it. But are, are you making that point because you suggest that that is an unjust position for your client to be in? Yes, my lord. Does that assume uh, that your client would not be able to get that relief in a global claim, in an available global claim jurisdiction? And if so, is there any evidence for that? Um, no, it, it doesn't. But, but um, the important point, my lord, is that it's about the, this, I mean, this claim uh, is now extant. Um, and it's about the justice done uh, in this claim, or what, what remedies are available or not in this claim, in my submission. Uh, because it's always been the case, for example, um, one, one could always turn around and say to a claimant in a mosaic jurisdiction case, well, I don't need to give you damages here because you can go and get global damages, isn't that better? Um, so, so the jurisdiction exists, um, it is in play, uh, and the question is about whether or not justice can be done um, in the circumstances of the particular case. Thank you. In other words, whilst the court uh, will be able to compensate the claimant for the harm caused to his reputation um, as at the date of judgment, uh, it won't then be able to take any steps um, to protect his Article 8 right to reputation in this regard in respect of ongoing publication of those very statements, um, or in, in respect of any similar new statement in this jurisdiction by the defendant, um, even uh, where the court takes the view um, that the claimant's Article 8 rights clearly and unequivocally outweigh the Article 10 rights of the defendant. Um, as in my submission, once we get to that point, must be the case because the defendant will have lost a trial uh, on the merits uh, and will have been found to have committed actual, actionable wrongs against the claimant which impinge on his Article 8 right uh, to reputation. Uh, and I should add um, that my learned friend takes no point um, about um, Article 8 for the purposes of the, this appeal uh, and whether the requisite threshold of seriousness is, is crossed. Um, so it, uh, it, it proceeds on the assumption that And my lords, it's not just that the um, court will not be able to do anything to remedy the claimant's um, situation. And this goes back, I think, uh, my lord, to a question you asked in a moment ago. The claimant will not be able to do anything about it either. He will not be able to bring any further libel proceedings in respect of the ongoing publication of those statements because of the operation of Section 8 of the Defamation Act 2013, the so-called single <coughs> publication rule by which the one-year limitation period uh, runs from the date of first publication. So if they, notwithstanding a resounding success for your client on the merits having, having been fought out of trial, they decide for some reason carry on publishing um, in exactly the same terms or something not materially different, then this problem arises. Yes. But not otherwise? Uh, not if they change it materially? Or if they, if they change it materially, If no. they take notice of what the court has decided after a trial and decide that if it, if maybe, they, take maybe it, they might um, no. not carry on? Well, it... it <laughs> And that is the that, that is the usual uh, course, but we are where we are with this application um, being brought uh, at this time. Um, we have to assume, for the present purposes, that, that would be the situation. Of course, the reality is often that the, well, almost inevitably, um, that the defendant simply takes it down um, and doesn't um, may not even require the imposition of injunctive uh, relief. 
Um, and in those circumstances, in my submission, the claim, there cannot be any sensible question um, around whether the claimant is being denied his right to an effective remedy. Um, he will be. Um, but um, it isn't really, as, as a, as my submission is that that cannot be right as an outcome, um, and it isn't. Um, because the good news, uh, if I can call it that, uh, is, is this. Um, first, that the judge's determinations in this regard um, turn primarily, um, if not almost exclusively, uh, upon an interpretation, uh, which we say is a misinterpretation, uh, of the decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, in Bolag, Supply, Slingen and Spence Hangby, uh, reported at 2018 for Queen's Bench Report at night page 963. Um, and there is a reading of that case which we say is the way in which it should obviously be read in any event, so not, not requiring any forced or strained um, reading. Uh, there's a way of reading that case that will enable the court uh, to act compatibly with the convention uh, of all parties throughout the lifetime of this case uh, by ensuring that the claimant remains able to obtain all appropriate relief to protect his Article 8 rights in this jurisdiction. And I'm now going, going to turn to say something uh, about uh, the parties and the claim. Um, the claimant uh, is an Italian national who holds a British passport, um, having obtained British citizenship along with his wife and two daughters in 2018. He's a businessman with more than 20 years experience in investment management and banking, and as the defendant acknowledges at paragraph two of its appeal skeleton, he does have substantial connections to the UK. His connections to the UK, uh, more specifically to London, um, are uh, many. They are educational, familial, professional, and personal. He first moved here in 1985 uh, to study economics and history at University College London, and has lived here for substantial periods since. His children have only ever lived in London, and are both in full-time education in the UK, uh, and London has always been the hub uh, of both his professional and personal life. And in consequence, his reputation here, both professionally and personally, uh, is of the utmost importance to him. Now, the defendant is the publisher of La Repubblica and L'Espresso. La Repubblica is a daily newspaper published online and accessible worldwide, uh, and in digital edition, uh, exact replica of hard copy edition. L'Espresso is a weekly current affairs magazine uh, published online and in digital and hard copy edition. Uh, the online version, again, is accessible worldwide. Uh, it also operates a Rep TV website and a YouTube channel on which it posts videos. Whilst it does primarily publish in Italian, from time to time it does also publish in England. Um, the claim uh, arises uh, as follows. Beginning on the 29th of September 2020, uh, the defendant published a series of four articles in La Repubblica and L'Espresso, uh, and two videos, one on Rep TV and one on YouTube, uh, in which it made a series of seriously defamatory allegations about the claimant. Um, all of those allegations uh, are about his dealings or alleged dealings uh, with the Vatican in relation to its, invest it, sorry, its investments uh, related to an iconic London building, um, 60 Sloan Square, uh, which is better known to some as the old home of Harrods, uh, now a luxury development. Um, more specifically, uh, the claimant maintains that the articles make allegations um, that there are very strong grounds to suspect uh, that he was a principal operator in a corrupt criminal scheme through which hundreds of millions of euros were stolen from Vatican funds. Now, one of those articles, my lords, was published in English, 
um, first published on the 30th of September 2020. Uh, and that is the second uh, article that was complained of uh, in what is now the re-amended particulars of claim. Uh, and my lords, I don't intend to, because it's not necessary for the purpose of this <coughs> appeal, um, to trudge um, in detail through uh, the re-amended particulars of claim. Um, but it may be worth just turning up um, the part pertaining to Article 2, uh, and that's in the supplementary bundle right at the back. It's the uh, final tab, tab 28. Uh, and the pleading in relation to the second article uh, begins <coughs> at, at paragraph 14. As I said, that was a publication in English with the headline, This is How They Stole Money from the Pope. Uh, and the defamatory implication or meaning um, which that article uh, is alleged to bear is set out at paragraph 15 um, of the pleading, uh, which is at page 248 of the bundle. Uh, and your Lordships will see that that meaning is as follows. Um, that there are very strong grounds to suspect that he was a directing mind behind an evil 454 million euro heist in which, through corruption and fraud, the Vatican's finances were mercilessly assaulted and plundered and hundreds of millions of euros, including money given for alms through charitable donations to Peter's tents, was stolen and is guilty of criminal offences as a result. Um, as well as publishing that article in English on its website, um, also on the 30th of September, sorry, yes, 30th of September 2020, uh, the defendant took active steps to draw it to the attention of its English-speaking followers, uh, tweeting in English via its Twitter handle at Republica, uh, three tweets with links to that article to its three million Twitter followers uh, over the course of that day. Uh, and that um, is also uh, pleaded <coughs> later on in the pleading in relation to serious harm, but I don't, I think, need to take your lordships to it. Um, all of those publications remain online. The claimant maintains that each of them has caused serious harm to his reputation in this jurisdiction, as well as causing him significant upset uh, and distress. So accordingly, by proceedings issued on the 17th of December 2020, uh, he issued libel proceedings here, uh, and the claim form your Lordships will have seen in the core bundle uh, at tab 6. Uh, and he seeks fast... <coughs> Compensatory damages, compensatory damages for the harm caused to his reputation here. At six, uh, an injunction to restrain the defendant um, from further publishing or causing to be published in this jurisdiction uh, the statements complained of or any similar words defamatory of the claimant. Uh, and then over the page at seven, an order pursuant to section 12 of the Defamation Act 2013, uh, the defendant published a summary of the judgment uh, in these proceedings. The claimant's claims for relief in these proceedings are and always have been um, confined to publication in this jurisdiction. Accordingly, his claim is what has been characterised following Shevel as a mosaic claim uh, under Regulation 7.2 of the Recast Brussels regulation. The defendant is being sued in the courts uh, for the place where the harmful event occurred. As I've already indicated, the defendant has not yet served any 
offence uh, and instead by application notice dated the 5th of February last year, uh, among other things, uh, it sought to strike out the entirety of the claimant's claims on the basis uh, that the court had no jurisdiction to try them uh, because the claimant could not establish a better than arguable case uh, that the um, publications complained of caused or were likely to cause serious harm uh, within the meaning of Section 1, 1 of the Defamation Act of 2013. Uh, and it also challenged the court's jurisdiction to try a claim uh, for final injunctive relief and to make a Section 12 order. Following service of the claimant's evidence in response, the defendant abandoned that serious harm challenge, which was the mainstay of the application for my submission, and by paragraphs 3 and 4 of the order uh, of the 27th of May, the judge ordered the defendant to pay the costs in this regard to be assessed if not agreed, um, together with a payment of 50,000 on account. Uh, the assessment uh, remains outstanding. In relation to the challenge to the jurisdiction in respect of injunctive relief, um, the judge dismissed the part of the application which related to the availability of final injunctive relief in respect of hard copy or print publications. So that remains an option for the judge at the end of the trial to make an order uh, in respect of future hard copy publications. Uh, but granted the application in respect of um, the internet injunction. Uh, similarly, in respect of the challenge to section 12, um, the judge dismissed the part of the application relating to the availability um, of such an order other than by way of a summary published online. Um, that means it will still be open to the court at the end of the trial um, to order a print version of the summary to be circulated uh, or to email its subscribers. Um, what it cannot do uh, is produce on a web page uh, a summary of the judgment, or cannot be ordered to do, is produce on a web page a summary of the judgment accessible. Just wondering, going back to your point about um, the sort of substantive injustice of all of this, um, if, we're, if that's a material factor, uh, how much of a constraint um, that last point is on the facts? Because it um, depends on the balance between subscription and non subscription access, I suppose. Yes. Um, and, and I don't Can you have just remind us what that. Well, I'm not what sure. We, what we know about that. No. I'm not sure that we... We don't know very much. ...do know very much right. um, about that. Because if, um, if it was well, a subscription-only publication, there wouldn't be much in your point. No, it's certainly not... They know who they are and they know where they are. It's certainly not a subscription-only publication, um, but there are certain, certain um, parts that are available only to subscribers, except the evidence suggests that sometimes those parts become inadvertently available um, well, you can't do much about that well, no. if we have an injunction against this defendant. No. It's just a fact. Yes. Um, but uh, if this assists, um, in relation to Section 12, uh, I take a similar position to my learned friend, uh, which is really that it, it stands or falls with the, I mean, the, 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 the mainstay, or the, the, the focus of my submission is certainly going to be uh, in relation to the uh, preventive uh, injunctive relief restraint. Well, there are different types of order, and they're actually directed at different things, aren't they? I mean, a section, it may, you may be right, I'm not quarrelling with the proposition that one stands or falls with the other, but they are different. The Section 12 order is really designed to, to, to mitigate harm from past publications. That's its main purpose, because I'm not working on the assumption that the person who's been vindicated by the court carry on saying it, um, whereas the injunction is there to prevent future publications, more harm by publication essentially to new people. So they're, they're looking, one's looking backwards and one's looking forward. Yes, yes. And geo, the, other, the other difference is that geo-blocking doesn't necessarily have the same significance when it comes to Section 12. That, that may well be right. Um, it's perhaps most. Depends how you do it. I, I suppose that's the most. Well, I, mean, I wouldn't pretend to have uh, any um, particular capability of, 
No, but I'm not, I'm not talking from a position, so of, from a position sure. of technical expertise. Yes. So. <laughs> no, no, I, but, but I think it's like, I mean, so the answer to some of those issues does depend on what the technology actually is or is not capable of in my definition. Yeah. Um, I can see um, an argument that the Section 12 order is somehow an equivalence has equivalence in the idea of, rec of rectification, that it's a sort of um, English version of a rectification order. Um, so I suppose the argument could be made on that basis. But yes, there are, there are points of distinction, um, but in my submission for the purposes of the appeal, um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't um, propose to draw them out particularly. Speaking for myself, I I might like to explore them further, but it may be better to do that um, later on in the submission. Yes, yes, please do. Uh, and if I can assist, I will. Um, so coming now, my lords, to the appeal, uh, the, you will have seen the appellant's notice and ground at tab one um, of the core bundle. Um, and as I've noted already, um, at page four uh, of the, you'll find at page four of that um, you'll see the parts of the order of the judge um, that are challenged. Uh, and then at page 7 uh, is set out um, the order which the claimant seeks to substitute uh, for the order of the judge. Uh, and that is as follows, um, that the defendant's application notice uh, be dismissed uh, and the defendant pay the claimant's cost the uh, application and of the appeal, such costs to be subject to detailed assessment on the standard basis, uh, if not agreed. Uh, and my Lord, you'll, you'll have seen as well that there are four uh, grounds of appeal. Uh, and those begin on page 12 uh, of tab 1. Uh, and I don't um, propose to take you through those, uh, save by way of headline. Uh, they are as follows. The first is that the judge erred in holding uh, that in light of the decision of the European uh, Court in Bolag Supply Slingen, uh, there is no jurisdiction to make a final injunction order uh, regarding online publication under Section 12 order, uh, and that there was a misinterpretation uh, of what the court, uh, the European Court in Bolag Supply Slingen, was saying. Um, second, uh, that the judge erred in concluding that Mr Justice Nichols' analysis uh, of Bolag Supply Slingen. I think, Ms. Skinner, you can probably take it. That, all right. That we're I'm all pretty familiar with the grounds. Thank you. Um, and, of course, uh, permission to appeal uh, was granted by uh, order of Lord Justice Arnold dated the 15th of October 2021, uh, and that was in respect of all of the grounds. Um, before turning um, to each of those, there are, my Lords, uh, a few preliminary points of emphasis uh, that I would like to make about Convention 1 uh, and the, the court's duty to act uh, compatibly with them uh, and how that impacts on this um, case. Um, and um, I appreciate um, that this is a rather back to basics. Um, uh, this is going to be rather back to basics, but I do think <coughs> in my submission it's important to, to do it. Um, and that is to go back to the wording of uh, Section 3 of the Human Rights Act. Uh, which we find uh, in the auth authorities tab uh, one at page three. And that should that should be electronic and um, hard copy page three. Uh, and that provides, my lords, and I know this is familiar, very familiar. Uh, that so far as it is possible to do so, primary legislation and subordinate legislation must be read and given effect in a way which is compatible with convention rights. Um, section 6, uh, as you uh, are aware, um, provides that it's unlawful for a public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with a convention right, uh, and of course a public authority includes a court. Um, that uh, is subject only to section 6.2, uh, which provides that subsection 1 
sorry, which provides that subsection 1 does not apply uh, to an act uh, if, as a result of the primary legislation, the authority could not have acted differently. Um, or in the case of one or more provisions are made under primary legislation which cannot be read or given effect in a way uh, which is compatible with convention rights, the authority was acting so as to give effect to or enforce those um, provisions. Um, and my, lord, my lords, it is in my submission um, important to bear uh, that in mind when approaching um, the question of what the appropriate interpretation uh, of Volag Supply Syndrome is. Of course, Volag Supply Syndrome is not itself primary legislation. Volag Supply Syndrome uh, is interpreting um, primary legislation, namely um, uh, Regulation 72 of the Recast Brussels Regulation. Um, and that it's also important, my lords, because the court. Um, what it emphasises is that the court is only relieved, if that's the right word, which it isn't, uh, of its duty to act compatibly if it's not possible to read or give effect to the legislation concerned in a way that is compatible. Paragraph 52 of my learned friend's skeleton argument, um, which is at page 303, should you wish to turn it up, um, he says that if uh, Article 7.2 uh, of, the, of the Recast Brussels Regulation uh, has the meaning and effect ascribed to it by Bolag Supply Syndrome, um, then there is simply no room for convention arguments, um, because under the uh, regulation, the Courts of Wales could not have acted differently. They could only have assumed jurisdiction uh, if the regulation permitted it, and it doesn't. But that, in my submission, um, is a fallacious argument because it ignores the fact that it is possible, without any strained or forced reading of any kind, um, to read Article 7.2 in a way that is compatible with convention rights. And it's also possible to read Bolag Supply Syndrome in that way. Um, and notable for its, for its absence um, from the defendant's submission, uh, for any suggestion that the reading or the interpretation contended by the claimant would be incompatible with the defendant's convention rights. Yes, there are certain points which I will come to about legal certainty, um, but there is no um, assertion that goes further than that, not suggested um, that the defendant's Article 10 rights would be um, fundamentally interfered with in a way that uh, is inc incompatible with them um, if we are right. Coming on then to ground one, um, which is uh, misinterpretation of the uh, ratio of Bolag supplies. Can I, can I just explore that a little? Yes. If, if the effect of uh, the injunction, uh, an injunction, which is sought in the mosaic, even though expressed to be confined to publication here, is in substance to remove publication elsewhere. Is that not an interference with Article 10 rights? Yes, my lord, but that's not this claim or this application. Well, I think it is said in this case that at the very least the injunction which you say is possible with geoblocking would restrain publication in Scotland and Northern Ireland? Uh, it is possible that it will have that. It, 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 well, yes, it may. Um, but if that were, if that were um, the factual si situation at the time when the judge is making the order, um, we would argue, we, our argument would be that that would be a proportionate interference. It's up to the um, defendant to choose how it complies with an order. Um, there is a world of difference in my submission between an order which is expressed in terms that require um, removal uh, and uh, an order that has an effect um, which may or one of, the, one of the ways of giving effect to that order is to remove. So at the end of the claim, um, if, if the order is an order restraining publication in this jurisdiction, the, 
defendant has a choice. The defendant can simply take it down. Um, and in reality, that is what most defendants do when they've lost a murder claim. If they haven't already removed it pending the outcome of the, um, of the, of the, of the claims. Um, or uh, it can um, take other steps, including um, geo-blocking. Uh, and as to the state of that technology, um, the evidence that we currently have, provided by solicitors, uh, not provided by um, experts in this field, um, suggests that certainly in relation to um, YouTube, the f there is only facility to block UK-wide. Uh, and in relation to Twitter, there is only facility to block UK-wide if, um, sorry, there is no facility unless you also upload a video, and then you can block um, so there is some small, on the, on the current state of the evidence, and I do emphasise that, um, there is some small extra territorial effect. Um, but that is not a reason, or in my submission, not an appropriate reason not to make the injunction at all. Would an injunction <coughs> granted under the Article 7.2 jurisdiction that had the effect preventing publication outside the mosaic territory in which that injunction was granted be prescribed by law? So you'd have jumped to stage, say it's proportionate. Well, again in my submission it comes back to, uh, it does come back to what the, what the terms of the injunction are, and, and the courts, when they make injunction orders, um, obviously if an injunction, I mean there are certain limits, um, the court should not be making an injunction that is impossible to comply with, um, or is, um, or is um, otherwise ob objectionable for some, um, for some reason. Um, that's sort of fun fundamental to the nature of the injunction. But as a matter of practical reality, operating in, in the world that we are now all operating in, where these things cannot be separated out and put into neat boxes, um, in my submission, provided the injunction was framed in a way, made it clear that it wasn't intended um, to reach beyond the borders of this jurisdiction, yes, it would be irrespective of the practical effect of that. It's just about the terms of the injunction. It yes, well, well not, not entirely irrespective. Because, yeah. because if, the, if, if, I mean, and this is where the kind of, this is where the inevitability question <coughs> was argued below um, came up. If, if, it, if it inevitably meant um, that it would be of worldwide <coughs> effect, um, then, then clearly there is an issue there. Um, because that is wholly disproportionate. Because the harm we're talking about is, is is in relation to one jurisdiction, and so then it becomes, in my submission, um, a, a question of degree. Well, the, 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 what speaking for myself, I would regard Bolag as undoubtedly establishing, is that there is some jurisdictional limit to the type of relief that can be granted in a mosaic claim. Yes. And in damages that. Would So that it is a jurisdictional question, simply, <coughs> of, uh, as to what is the extent of injunctive relief that can be granted in a mosaic claim. Now, if that's right, and if one needs to look at what is the practical effect of the injunction which is being sought, leave aside your point about whether we do that now or later, is that is that not a jurisdictional question rather than a discretionary question? It's the scope of the relief for which there is jurisdiction, which there is jurisdiction to grant in a mosaic claim. My Lord, it may be, but it is in my submission a question of, of degree. I, so if it, if it were inevitable, um, that making such um, an order would be of universal effect, um, then that does call into question um, the existence of the jurisdiction. 
because, because the claimant is clearly obtaining um, by way of a mosaic claim relief which is only appropriately available to him um, on a full claim, a centre a center of interest or a defendant's domicile well, claim. Well, let's I understand that. Bolag was a case of universal effect on its, yes. on its effect. Yes. But uh, is it not still a jurisdictional question? if it has some extraterritorial effect, albeit not universal effect? Well, my lord, no, because I, because I, I don't have an immediate um, <coughs> example to mind, but um, on analysis, it may, I would be extremely surprised if many orders that the courts make all the time don't have, um, don't have the jurisdictional impact beyond where they are intended to um, to have effect um, and, and if that were the test uh, for the existence of the jurisdiction in the first place um, that could cause um, quite significant disruption of my submission to the system Well but it's well established that you can make an order that goes beyond the precise contours of the right yes. you're seeking to protect yes. because that's maybe the only practical way of yes. doing it but that presupposes that you have jurisdiction do what you're doing. We're dealing here with what is a special jurisdiction, yes. um, which is, depending on how one reads the authority, but one view is, um, confined in its subject matter to the uh, to granting remedies in respect to publication within the jurisdiction or the territorial jurisdiction of the Mosaic Court. Um, so we're dealing with a different situation. As you say, m many times courts make, make orders that are <coughs> within their jurisdiction to go beyond the rights because that's the only practical way of doing it. Um, but this is different. Well, my lord, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it is because it, it, uh, if if the if the effect of that is to say, well, because there is a, a risk, um, because we don't have the evidence. Um, the, the, the final say on the evidence, but it, because there is a risk that there may be some small extraterritorial impact of this, then we can't. Then there cannot be that jurisdiction, and the entirety of the remedy is denied. Um, it seems to me that this is why it's necessary before coming to the question of what um, the recast fossils regulation and Bolag say um, to have very much in mind um, the court's duty to act compatibly with convention rights. Because it, that, in my submission, does inform fundamentally the question about what the approach to the interpretation should be. Um, so I'm on my on my first ground, the um, ratio of, of Bolag supply selenium, and I do not propose to take the court uh, in detail through each and every authority. As well. um, but there are a few points of emphasis that I do wish, wish to make. Um, now, obviously, I've dealt with this in my um, skeleton um, at paragraphs 24 and following. Um, and as the court is aware, the, the shovel, um, it was shovel that established the availability of the mosaic claim uh, under what is now uh, Article 72. Uh, and the reasoning, I, I do um, extract that in my skeleton at paragraph 26 page 266 of the replacement skeleton of um, international libel uh, and the fact that damage could be caused in multiple 
different places. Uh, and the court held, um, the, uh, sorry, 29, uh, in the case of an international libel through the press, the injury caused by a defamatory publication to the honour, reputation, and good name of a natural or legal person occurs in the places where the publication is distributed and the victim is known in those places. It follows that the courts of each contracting state in which the defamatory publication was distributed and in which the victim claims to have suffered injury to his reputation have jurisdiction to rule on the injury caused in that state um, to the victim's rep reputation. Um, so that was um, the start point, um, the result of which it was made clear that that the claimant could bring a claim for all the damage caused uh, in the place of domicile to the defendant in accordance with the general rule uh, or in jurisdictions where the libel was published for the loss suffered in that jurisdiction. Um, and the next case um, in the Sorry, just, was, be, just before we leave that, yes. do, we, do we need to go to the case itself and, and look at paragraph 33, uh, which I think is in tab 7 of the first volume of Meat of it. So I'll give you a moment. Not there yet. Right. Yes, my lord. Sorry. satisfaction of being such a dinosaur as I am and I use paper bundles I do sometimes get there more quickly than others. <laughs> um, anyway you, you, you've got power 33. Yes I have my now and, and as, as, as I read the gist, the gist of it picking it up just below letter H uh, which have jurisdiction I, this is the mosaic court jurisdiction to award damages for all the harm caused by the defamation uh, all before the courts of each contracting state sorry this is the mosaic court before the courts of each contracting state in which the publication was distributed, and where the victim claims to have suffered injury to his reputation, which have jurisdiction to rule solely in respect of the harm caused in the state of the court seized. Now that's past harm, but we know that in Article 7.2 we're dealing with harm which is caused or may be caused. And, uh, it seems we're really on the maybe for the purposes of the injunction. So that might suggest, might it, that it's a question of jurisdiction, and the jurisdiction is to rule solely in respect of the risk of harm to be caused in the state of the court seized, i.e. jurisdiction limited, jurisdiction limited to relief in relation to harm within the mosaic court's jurisdiction. If that is right, um, well, I think it's important in my submission to bear in mind the, the, the context um, in which the court is giving the judgment, because when it, when it, when it contrasts that situation, the special jurisdiction position, uh, to the general one, if you look at um, paragraph 33, you can see uh, there, um, what, it, what, what, what the court does when it contrasts it um, is re in referring to the general jurisdiction, um, is to refer to the court having power to order compensation for the whole of the damage caused. Uh, what is not um, investigated or analysed or dealt with um, in any um, substantive way uh, are other forms of relief. So well, I understand that. Of ongoing but but it, would be, it would be surprising. So, but, well, it? but it's, it's framed in a way, but the argument has been framed in a way such that the court is talking about jurisdiction um, to give compensation for the whole of the damage caused or jurisdiction to give damage for the harm caused in that jurisdiction only. But that would involve, I'm sorry to interrupt you, that would involve reading the principles as saying in relation to previous harm from a previous defamation, the jurisdiction is strictly limited 
in relation to preventing future harm, it isn't so strictly limited. In in, in the because you're saying injunction principles are, <coughs> are, are different from what was being, being considered well, there, and in relation to future harm, which is what in, the injunction is concerned with, um, one needn't therefore be confined to a jurisdiction solely in respect of harm caused in the no, state it, but of it would the be, but, you, but it would be confined solely to the question of future harm caused in that jurisdiction. I certainly don't go beyond that. Um, but, 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 but in my submission, it's not right to read Chevel. I'm sorry, could, uh, uh, that, that seems to me fatal to your argument because you're, you're suggesting that it doesn't matter if it has some extraterritorial effect. No, I, I believe we're talking, I'm sorry, it's probably my fault. Yeah, it's probably, probably, my, probably my fault. I, I, my, my submission, um, in, t in terms of future harm, um, the, the court, th this does not stop. Um, the court um, or, or doesn't say that there is no jurisdiction um, to make orders of effect in that jurisdiction in relate to prevent future harm occurring there. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, and I think the fundamental point about Chevel is that it's the court isn't being asked to look at the whole package. Um, it, it uses as a shorthand, in my in my submission. Um, the question of compensation. Is it for the whole or is it for the compensation in that jurisdiction? It's not considering questions about other remedies, the availability of other remedies. Not because um, those should be diff treated differently in my submission, they shouldn't be. They should, they should fall in line with the question of compensation. So I, I think you'd say <clears throat> that in the, the, the logic of Chevron, um applied to a case where you're looking for an injunction limited to preventing further publication within the jurisdiction of the court seat is that there's nothing wrong with that. Yes. And Bolag's supply Sningen doesn't say otherwise. Yes, sir. Um, all that fine, and we still get, come back to the question of whether extraterritorial effect is, is a problem for the jurisdiction or just something to go into the, the evaluation. Yes. Um, so, um, so that was Chevron and of course the, in my submission the purpose of Chevron was to ensure to meet um, a problem that was occurring in relation to harm caused to claimants in different jurisdictions. It was to give a claimant an extra way um, of remedying that harm. Um, and that, in my submission, is what is fundamental to the case law that has developed since. What the courts have been doing, the European courts, um, is adding to the uh, available routes by which a claimant can seek to remedy harm because of the prolifer proliferation of ways in which um, harmful defamatory statements can be published. Um, and in, in my submission, to read any of to, to, to read any of those development since, and I'll come to deal with them in, a little, in more detail, in a way which is restrictive of um, the remedies available to the claimant, um, is, a mis is a misreading of them. And if we look at, for example, um, particularly actually when one looks at what the Advocates General were arguing um, in each of the cases, and the fact that, the, for example, sorry, in Volag Supply Sling, and I'm jumping ahead of myself here, um, the Advocate General um, was arguing um, for getting rid of, if to put it colloquially, the mosaic jurisdiction altogether. And the court didn't do that. The court retained um, that jurisdiction. Um, and for example, in E-Date, um, the court, uh, uh, as your lordships are well aware, added a third option for the claimant. So it's adding to the range um, of remedies for the claimant uh, by establishing a new basis or um, identifying an additional basis uh, on which a claimant can claim, um, namely by bringing a claim for all the damage caused uh, in the place where he has his uh, centre of interest. Um, and that remedy was added to uh, the suite of remedies already available um, to, for, in light of the ubiquity of the content 
Um, it was not, in my submission, intended to restrict the claimant's right um, to access remedies already available um, if he's bringing his claim under another of the heads, for example, under the, the Mosaic um, jurisdiction. I, 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 I'm not challenging your proposition that these were methods introduced for the purposes of giving claimants a greater range of options, but they also give defendants a greater range of options, don't they? Because a defendant can always bring an action for a declaration of non-liability if they do so in a permissible global jurisdiction, the claimant stuck with that one. Yes. Um, but, the, but, the, but the fundamental um, reasoning behind adding that extra um, jurisdiction was, was to recognise um, and deal with um, a, growing, a growing way in which harm could be caused. And indeed, in the EDATE claim case, um, that is the part <coughs> which has 10 of the bundles. Um, the court um, expressly preserved the claim claim um, in respect of each member state uh, where the content placed online um, has been accessible and it does it did that at paragraph 51 uh, and 52 and my lords it is expressed as those courts have as jurisdiction only in respect of the damage caused in the territory of the member state uh, of the court seized. Um, but that is, of course, because an action um, that's because that that's how that's that's because that's how the action is brought. I mean, in a libel claim, of course, it's the publication, um, and that's the harm caused. Um, but it doesn't, my, in my submission, that language does not then mean that by definition um, remedies in ter in which go to future harm uh, are not available. That's not what paragraph 51 is saying. And we see a paragraph 52. that in the event of an alleged infringement of personality rights by means of content placed online on an internet website, a person who considers that his rights have been infringed has the option of bringing an action for liability in respect of all the damage caused, either before the courts or of the member state in which the publisher of that content is established, or before the courts of the member state at which the centre of his interest uh, is based. That person may also, instead of an action for liability in respect of all of the damage caused, bring his action before the courts of each member state in the territory of which content placed online is or has been accessible. Those courts have jurisdiction only in respect of the damage caused in the territory of the member sta state of the court seized. And this, my lord, is making the same um, point again: is that the, the court, that the way that the court approaches it is to divide it up by looking at the damage. Um, that the court, that the action can um, cover or, or deal with. Um, there is nothing in there about other remedies. Uh, and in my submission, that must be, because they, the, the assumption is that they, they are streamlined to match <coughs> the damage. One would have expected, given the length of time that's passed since Cheville, that there would be a case yes. in which this had actually been done. Or at least consider, um, but neither side has, has, has shown us one. Um, just we, we just don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my lord, uh, as I say, I mean that, that experience tells us that at the end of a long um, libel trial, uh, if a defendant loses, um, it just these these points become somewhat academic. Mm. Um, so that may be why. Um, and then, my lords, when we come on to Bolag Supply 
Stingham itself. were an Estonian company, one of its employees, uh, who brought an action before an Estonian court uh, for an order that a Swedish trade association uh, rectified incorrect information published on its website uh, pertaining to the company, uh, delete comments appearing there, and pay the company compensation for the harm sustained, uh, and also pay the employee compensation for non-material damage. Uh, for reasons we don't, uh, my submission needs to go into, um, the, by the time it got to the um, European Court, um, the concern was in the, the, the position of the individual um, was no longer in question before the court, and it was only the company. Um, but as I say, that doesn't um, matter. Uh, and what the court held um, was that a person who considered that his personality rights had been infringed by means of online content on a website had to have the option of bringing an action for damages in respect of the harm caused before the courts of the member state in which his centre of interest was based, so that's E date, and then um, secondly, uh, and this is more important for the purposes of this appeal, uh, that in the light of the ubiquitous nature of the information and content placed online on the website, and the fact that the scope of their distribution was in principle universal, an application for the rectification of the former and the removal of the latter um, was a single and indivisible application and could consequently only be made before a court with jurisdiction to rule on the entirety of an application for compensation for damage. Uh, and my lords, I don't quibble with that. In my submission, that's right. Because what that is dealing with is an application for there is, a, there is a website with some words on it and this is an application uh, to remove those words rectify them uh, and delete comments made about underneath them uh, and if that application succeeds the effect is a universal one it doesn't just happen in that jurisdiction in Estonia it happens worldwide And that um, was why, in my submission, um, that application um, offended against um, the, the, or, or went beyond the jurisdiction available in a mosaic claim, because it was in respect of something um, which, if granted, would be of universal effect. Uh, and we say it's because it was made in respect of, or to amend, material at its source. Um, now, the defendant quibbles with that and says, well, we don't find that anywhere um, in Bolag Supply Singen itself. But in my submission, that's the only sensible reading of it. Um, and in particular, um, my lords, if one goes to the Advocate General's opinion, uh, which I accept was not followed by the court, but does assist in understanding the context uh, in which the court was operating, what goes to that? Um, it's at page 387 of the bundle, paragraph 119, uh, where the Advocate General is uh, addressing the question of jurisdiction for an injunction ordering the rectification and removal of allegedly harmful information, uh, and says this. In the final part of this opinion, I will turn to the issue raised by the first preliminary question. If the Chevron Mosaic approach to international jurisdiction for territorially limited damage is maintained, does it confer on the national court the competence to issue a cross-border injunction, such as the one requested in the main proceeding? In other words, if the competence of the Estonian court is limited to the harm caused to the claimant on Estonian territory, can they issue an injunction ordering the defendant in Sweden to 
correct and delete the harmful information in its entirety. Uh, and that in my submission makes it absolutely clear what the issue was that the court was wrestling with in Bolag supplies Megan. Um, and that is why it is different from um, the issue that is before the court uh, in this case. Because it is not an application uh, to correct and delete harmful information in its entirety, and nor will it have that effect. Uh, and um, having identified that problem, um, the Advocate General goes on um, to um, posit um, several potential ways uh, of dealing with it, um, none of which um, identify, analyse, consider um, the existence of geo-blocking. That word does not appear anywhere. Instead, what the Advocate General was, uh, does is, is try to um, think about, well, could, would it be possible for the National Court, for the, for the national court to somehow um, issue an injunction with, to correct a proportional part of the allegedly harmful information? Um, that's at paragraph 128. Would the defendant be asked to delete only a proportionate segment of the information, or just a portion of the comments? Well, obviously, that's a wholly unsatisfactory way um, of dealing with the problem. Uh, and at paragraph 129, um, the Advocate General acknowledges this and says such a rather absurd consideration clearly points to just one possible answer. Provided that a court of a member state is competent to hear an extra contractual tortious action for damages, it should also be entitled to rule on the issue of all the remedies that are available under national law. And as a result of paragraph <coughs> 130, leads to the recommendation to the court to limit the international jurisdiction over internet related tortious claims to two heads uh, of special jurisdiction. This all proceeds on the assumption that as a matter of fact there's no possibility of what he calls a proportional division of the Yes, because, because, um, because what, what, what and, he's, and that was in 2017 or whenever it was. Yeah. It, and also he's only jurisdiction. looking at what he's only considering well you know, if we've got um, ten words on the page, um, should the court order two of them to be deleted? Because that would be a proportional amount um, by reference to the, the harm caused in this particular jurisdiction, which is obviously a bit... So, uh, I think your argument is that, that the court and the Advocate General just didn't consider the kind of factual situation that we're presented no. with. No, and, and not surprisingly, because they weren't being asked to. No. Well... It, it, it was, given what we've just looked at, it, it might have been thought relevant to inquire whether that was, that factual assumption was correct. Well, it, it, but they, it doesn't seem that that took place. No, indeed not. Um, but there is, a, I mean, a, a, as I've said, there's no consideration or recognition of the role of geo-blocking, um, and in my submission that must be because of the question that the court concerned with, which was a question of removal at source. Um, and it's clear from the what the Advocate General says that that is what was troubling um, the courts, because the injunction sought, the relief sought, um, was in terms uh, which would be of universal, it was in universal terms. Um, the court's judgment begins at page 392. Again, we see at paragraph two um, that the requests are for the rectification of allegedly incorrect information published on the website, the deletion of related comments on a discussion forum on that website, and compensation for harm um, allegedly suffered. It's plain in my submission 
again that this is all about removal at source. So by definition, that claimant, if successful, would have obtained uh, more than she was properly entitled to. She was, she was properly entitled to um, in the exercise of the Chevron Mosaic jurisdiction um, because that order would have been uh, of a global global effect. Not only of global effect, but it's in global terms. It's perhaps the more uh, offensive part of it. Um, um, my Lord, the more recent case my lord, the more recent case uh, of GT Flix, um, in my submission, bolsters um, that position. Um, that's at tab 18 of the bundle. Judgment from the 21st of December last year. This was a request for a preliminary ruling uh, about the interpretation of Article 72. Uh, GT Flix uh, TV, an adult entertainment company established in the Czech Republic. I'm looking at paragraph 2. Uh, and DR, uh, another professional in that field, uh, domiciled in Hungary. Um, GT Flix uh, had made uh, an application for re rectification uh, and removal uh, of allegedly disparaging comments about it, uh, which DR had placed online on several websites and internet forums, uh, and a claim that compensation for the damage uh, allegedly suffered as a result. Uh, the application, uh, as I said, GT Flix was established in the Czech Republic, um, and I'm now at paragraph 11. With a centre of interest there, uh, DR was domiciled in Hungary, but the application for rectification uh, and removal uh, was made um, before uh, the French court action for interim recognition. Noted at paragraph 18 that the referring court has doubts that whether a person who, considering that his or her rights have been infringed by the dissemination of disparaging comments on the internet, seeks not only the rectification of the information and the removal of the content, uh, but also compensation for the resulting non material and economic, economic damage, may claim uh, before the courts of each member state in which content published online is or was accessible uh, compensation caused in that member state. Uh, whether pursuant to the judgment of Bolags, the Kleismingen, uh, that person must make that application for compensation before the court of jurisdiction to order rectification of the information and removal of the disparaging comments. And what, what the court notes, uh, and this in my submission is important, is that an, a distinction is drawn at paragraph 28. Uh, where they first note um, there is nothing in the order for reference to suggest that the case in the main proceedings concerns the possibility of bringing an action before the French courts on the basis of the place of the event giving rise to the damage. But then this, the question does arise, however, as to whether the French courts have jurisdiction on the basis of the place where the alleged damage occurred, that's the mosaic. In addition, as noted by the referring court, GT Flix TV did not request the information and the comments at issue in the main proceedings be rendered inaccessible in France. So it's drawing a distinction there in my submission between what the application was about, uh, which is um, rectification and removal on all the websites at source, and another type of application that could have been made but wasn't, um, which was to render um, the information and comments at issue inaccessible in France. And so the court there is drawing that um, distinction, and that is the case, um, the, what the claimant seeks to do here. And 
terms of the injunctive relief sought, it would simply be um, to render um, the statements complained of inaccessible in this jurisdiction. And then it goes on um, to note a paragraph 32. In the light of the ubiquitous nature of the information and content placed online on a website, the fact that the scope of their distribution is in principle universal, the court has nevertheless specified that an application for the rectification former and removal of the latter is a single and indivisible application of that and can consequently only be made before a court with jurisdiction to rule on the entirety of an application for compensation for damage, not before a court that does not have jurisdiction to do so, a bow lag supply syndrome. And so this case, GT Flix, uh, was a case on all fours uh, with the position in bow lag supply syndrome. The relief sought was identical, um, but the court did note in passing what the relief sought was not. Namely, it was not to render um, the material inaccessible in part. And because the relief sought was universal in nature, fell on all, squ all, all four square uh, with Bolag Supply Slingen um, and could not be granted on a mosaic basis. My lords, uh, if you go on to paragraph 36, <coughs> see there, um, that the court in relation to an application for rectification of information and removal of content placed online, on the one hand, and on the other, application for compensation for the damage allegedly resulting from that placement. What the court says about that is, while those applications are based on the same facts, their purpose, their cause, and their divisibility are different, and there is therefore no legal necessity that they be examined jointly by a single court. Um, and it's recognising um, that there is, that the question, or the important question, is the question of divisibility. Because an, act, an application for removal at source is not divisible, it will be of global effect. Um, it is not available in a mosaic form. Whereas applications that are divisible, um, there is no reason in principle why they should not be. My Lord, it, it's for those reasons uh, that we say um, that the um, judge and the defendant um, have got the interpretation of Bolag Supply um, Slingen wrong. Um, and before moving on to my second ground, I'm going to deal with um, each of the de defendant's five reasons, um, which he sets out. Uh, it sets out at page, uh, sorry, paragraph 23 and following of my learned friend's skeleton. Uh, as to why the judge's interpretation is to be preferred. First, it's asserted um, that there's no meaningful distinction between removal and rectification and an injunction preventing publication in the jurisdiction. Um, my lords, for the reasons I've already given, uh, there is the whole point of a mosaic claim is that it's limited to the harm caused in that place, and all relief claims should also be so limited. Rectification and removal are global in effect and are completely different um, to blocking access, for example, um, from one um, jurisdiction. So I've, I've noted your submission as being all, all relief claims should be limited to <coughs> being in respect of the harm caused in the mosaic jurisdiction. Is that right? Yes. Or are you using as the harm caused as a, as a short a shorthand. Um, I certainly don't intend by saying that to concede that um, there's no there's no 
jurisdiction in respect to future harm um, that may, or continuing harm um, that may occur in relation to the ongoing publication of the same statements in that journal. But the, so same that, principle, the same principle should apply to future, to, yes. to future harm. Yes. Thank you. Um, in responding, um, in its first point, in its first point of response, um, it said. Um, that the point of distinction that I make in my skeleton argument about a Section 13 order, um, which is this, um, that if we were seeking removal at source, we would also have asked for a Section 13 order, uh, which specifically provides that a court may order the operator of a website um, to remove an offending statement. The, defenders, the defendant says there's nothing in that um, because Section 13 orders aren't available against defendants. They're to deal with third parties. Um, in my, that, that, the wording of um, Section 13, my lords, is not so limited. Uh, the relevant section is Section 13.1a, uh, and it refers uh, to the operator of a website. <coughs> Page seven. Order to remove statement or cease distribution. So this is um, a bowleg supply shingen type order, uh, and I see it's headed third parties. If one looks at the actual wording, um, thirteen one, where a court gives judgment for the claimant in an action for defamation, court may order a the operator of a website on which the defamatory statement is posted to remove the statement, uh, or B, any person who was not the author, editor, or publisher of the defamatory statement to stop distributing, selling, or exhibiting material containing the statement. So why, whereas B um, is um, phrased in such a way as to make that relief not available as against a defendant, um, 1A is not so um, confined defendant also happens to be the operator of a website on which the defamatory statement is posted, um, then an order under Section 31A, in my submission, may, well, may be made, um, subject to um, the constraints of a mosaic claim. Well, <coughs> that, that may be true. I mean, the wording seems to be very broad, but um, there was no need for such a provision in relation to the defendant, because the court could do the same. Uh, well, It, it wouldn't make an order for removal. It may, may make an order that, that would have that effect, but it wouldn't be an order for removal. Well, we, we can get asked to make these orders. I don't think they're, they're, they're orders we don't have jurisdiction to make. We don't often make them. But um, a mandatory injunction saying um, not only must you not continue publishing the libel, but you must take it down is, is, is yes. something the court could do. Um, the second point that my learned friend says that, well, if the, if the court thought there was any meaningful distinction um, to be drawn, it would have said so. Um, that, um, again, in my, in my submission, um, reveals um, fallacious logic. The court was not being asked to address that point. So why should it have said so? Um, it was being asked to address... Um, uh, an order, an application for an order for rectification and removal um, at source. The example given is, well, why wouldn't the court send back the question, well, can't the order may be made for rectification or removal expressed to be limited to online material available in Estonia? Well, that would still be of universal effect unless the, court, unless the um, defendant was going to um, create some sort of mirror website with it not on it for the purposes of publication in Estonia. Uh, the argument is also made um, that the judge's formulation gives a proper recognition um, to the policy objective, um, of the twin policy objectives of legal certainty and proximity. Um, 
This assumes, in my submission, uh, wrongly, that the claimant's formulation um, does not. But the, de the defendant on the claimant's formulation uh, can reasonably foresee being sued in the jurisdiction where the harmful event occurred, um, because that is what Article 72 says. Uh, and I note in passing that the wording of Article 72 is about where someone can be sued. It is not about where someone may claim for damages. It's not so restricted. So the defendant can reasonably foresee um, that he may, he, he may be sued uh, in a place uh, where a harmful event occurred. What, uh, that has long uh, been established as the position. Uh, uh, there's no problem with that um, in my submission in terms of um, either legal certainty or indeed proximity, especially now we have the serious harm um, test that must be met. In fact, the centre of interest formulation is, if any, the much trickier concept for a defendant to deal with um, on the legal certainty front. Because how is a defendant publisher um, going to have any real oversight or insight into where the claimant's centre of interests are? It's the centre of interests, not a mosaic claim um, that leads to fact-sensitive questions and um, issues about legal certainty. Uh, yet the courts um, appear confident um, that a centre of interest test is sufficiently certain criterion, and if it is, then um, by necessary um, inference, that must also include, a mosaic claim must also meet that test, uh, even more so. Um, moreover, the jurisdiction is not dependent, in my submission, um, on the availability of geoblocking, because geoblocking is available as a technology. Um, and it cannot be right that the question as to whether or not a particular defendant happens to utilise it um, is dispositive of the question of whether an injunction should be granted or not. Um, that's reasoning um, backwards. So when you say it's not dependent on the availability of geo-blocking, you mean it may be dependent on its availability, but it's not dependent on whether the Yes, in that sense, yes. If, 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 if there were no geo-blocking technology so that uh, internet publication was indivisible and universal, then you are plainly within the zone, aren't you? Yes. But, but the, the point you're making is um, the availability may be relevant yes. whether, whether a defendant chooses to yes. take advantage of that. So it's a is yes. not, it's not it's a defendant's choice. They can either just take it down to comply, or they can go to the expense and trouble of um, acquiring appropriate technology to do so. It's up to, it's up to the defendant. Um, but also, um, whilst we're on the question of geo-blocking, um, my lords, there is, a, there is a point here that this is somehow just treated as being somehow uh, fundamentally different to um, print copy uh, and control of print copy. Um, as a matter of reality, um, no defendant ever has complete control of where their print copies go either. They can take such steps as they can um, to limit uh, or prevent copies from entering a certain jurisdiction, but that doesn't mean that they um, will never enter the jurisdiction by, by some other route. Um, because I, and I make this point because... Uh, one, one of the things that is said against it um, is, well, it's easy to get around all this because people can get virtual private networks. And there are all these sorts of arguments raised, which, in my submission, don't, 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 ought not to take the defendant anywhere. The fact that people can get around things um, is not a reason for the court not making an order in the, in the first place. Um, and similarly, uh, and I, I realise I'm at risk of repeating myself, the fact that if it be a fact, um, that there is some 
because of current um, deficiencies in geo-blocking, um, there is um, an inability to restrict solely to India and Wales. The fact that there is that small extraterritorial effect, in my submission, that should not mean there is no jurisdiction. It should be a question about proportionality when it comes to making um, the order for an injunction. Uh, and of course, geo blocking um, is not the only um, is not the only available uh, technology. Uh, one of the um, uh, and this is referred to um, in Ms. Sanders' statement, um, but, but there is of course um, the ability to geo locate users. Um, so in terms of the in terms of, it may not be that we're just talking about geo-blocking. Um, there may be other ways of complying with orders that are not just about blocking access to a whole jurisdiction. It might be that they can be, it might be that it can be dealt with in some other way, by, by ways of geo, of it, is, um, it is possible to geolocate individual internet users. Not just the question of bringing the shutters down on a whole jurisdiction. Um, so this is why, in my submission, it is dangerous to get into the territory uh, of making decisions about jurisdiction based on assumptions about what the technology Michael, I'm not, can do. I'm not, I'm not really following. If we're just looking at an injunction to prevent future access by people within a jurisdiction, uh, how can geolocation? those who X hypothesis have not yet availed themselves of the access. And if they're not, so if they try to locate it from a particular location, then they can't, then they wouldn't be able to. That's, that's geo-blocking, isn't it? Well, I, I, it's my fault, I'm not, well, not, I'm not understanding. No, 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 I, no, 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 I, I don't have in mind the particular passage. Instead of using IP addresses, you're using some other method of locating the person. This by reference to their mobile phone and it's yes, and where, and when GPS. They're, Yes, Coolness. and things like that. Um, um, I, I raise that not because I'm able to um, assist very much with it, but just because I'm aware that there are, is other technology out there. Um, and it would, in my submission, be wrong to um, limit the availability of relief based on an assumption about what the technology available can do or is capable particularly in an area like this, where the situation is evolving all the time, um, and the position uh, is very different from that even before the court in Berlin applies Snowden. Can you just, we need to go to, can you just give me the reference in Sanders? Uh, yes. Um, the okay. I've written it down somewhere. Don't worry, in, in your No, words. no, no, I can... Um, don't, don't let me hold you up. Sorry to interrupt your flow. You say assumptions about what is or is not available. Was the judge not required to act on the evidence she had? Well, she did, um, but that was what I mean. One of my submissions was that that, that the, the, the application was premature in that sense. That the judge should not have been making that decision now, because the appropriate time to be looking at the position um, is after the trial. Um, and to look at the factual position then, if the factual position does need to be looked at for the purposes of determining appropriate relief. So if at the end of the trial the evidence had were to be as it currently is or was before the, the, the judge below, do you say that um, there's, there wouldn't be any jurisdictional bar to getting the injunction? Yes. Yes, we do. Because you say it's not a matter of jurisdiction at all. It's, it's a matter of discretion, stroke convention, right, proportionality. Yes, um, well, yes, but um, it is subject to, obviously, I mean, all of these things are subject to um, limits of interpretation. 
Uh, and if the state of the evidence was that um, if an order is made restraining publication in this jurisdiction, it means that that will be the only way of complying with it is to remove it completely. Um, then I would say that, that there cannot be that jurisdiction because that that runs straight into um, Bolag supply suit is, is contrary to, is contrary to it. But that does rather suggest its jurisdiction is at least orthodoxly something which has to be dealt with on the first challenge. And the question of whether the jurisdiction has to be based on the state of the evidence now. I don't think that could be right. I think it comes back to looking at what are the ter what are the terms of the order sought, um, and also, I mean, I would say in relation to what what is the state of the evidence now. The state of the evidence now um, is that it is largely disputed, except in relation to two small points about YouTube and and Twitter, um, and in those cases, um, it is accepted. That at the moment, when I say at the moment, of course, this is last year, I don't know what the position is today. Um, but in terms of YouTube, it's only possible to geo block UK wide. Um, and in terms of <coughs> Twitter, as I said earlier, it's only possible to geo block at all um, if um, a video is uploaded at the same time, and then it's UK wide. Um, but in relation to everything else, the evidence is disputed. Uh, and so, in order to properly determine, question of jurisdiction when first challenged, what, what one is, in a case such as this, what one is looking at as a, matter, as a matter of reality is not a series of witness statements from solicitors about the state of the technology. What ought to happen um, is that evidence is put before the court, if not expert evidence, um, at least evidence from <coughs> persons with knowledge of this technology and its capability and its cost. Well, that's quite he heterodox in relation to jurisdiction challenges. There are often disputed facts which arise on jurisdiction challenges. Um, wait, wait and see uh, is, is not an approach, as far as I'm concerned, is heterodox. That's why we have these tests, which may have some difficulty of application of who has better of the arguments and so on. I mean, is the, the way I'm looking at it at the moment is that if <coughs> the practical effect of the order <clears throat> regardless of its literal terms, is critical to the question of jurisdiction, then the issue has to be determined on the evidence available to the judge at the time he or she is hearing the Part 11 application. And it's the, uh, the onus is on the uh, claimant <clears throat> to meet the standard. And if evidence is required to show that an injunction in these terms would not go beyond the boundaries of territorial jurisdiction. If, if, if all of that's right, then the deficiencies in the evidential uh, scenario are, are a problem for your client. Subject well, to your point about what the evidence actually shows. But, yes, um, I, mean, I mean, well, if there's, yeah. quite difficult, if there's a conflict of evidence, because there are certain points that the defendant, for example, the um, geolocation point that I to is simply not answered by the defendant. So what's the court to do with that? You can um, make a judgment applying the standards in the authorities on what, what, whether, whether the um, good arguable case has been established. Yes, and in relation to, it's important in, in my submission also to bear in mind this, in relation to extraterritorial, if the, if the problem is really it, on, the, on the state of the evidence, it's only about YouTube and Twitter, well, that can be dealt with. That's not a reason for denying the relief in its entirety. In, in its entirety. Pages 95 to 6. Point 
been made that the defendant's group of companies um, has apparent expertise in targeting communications, including by geographic location, uh, and refers to its own website, uh, which states of Manzoni, a part of the defendant's group, uh, that the digital unit offers high-profile communication possibilities, and thanks to the various data platforms, it allows Manzoni to reach specific targets based on socio-demographic information, interests, and geographical areas. Sorry, I'm lost. You're going to have to give me the reference again. I'm sorry. It's the Supplemental Bundle. Supplemental Bundle, tab, tab 10. Tab 10. First uh, statement. Page 95. 95. Yes, it's, sorry, it's um, Joanne Sanders' statement. Yeah. Sorry, so which page are we? At page 95. It's paragraph. begins on paragraph 60. the evidence was um, putting um, Mr. Bayes and Ms. Sanders together was that in relation to um, website access as opposed to YouTube or Twitter um, it, it would be feasible to geo-block an individual article or articles um, in relation to all IP addresses in the UK. That was the state of the evidence. Yes, but it, it, well, but it wasn't accepted because they were only looked at one particular provider. Well, <coughs> but Ms Sanders doesn't addresses the particular provider. Um, she doesn't come up with any, set, well, what you ought to do is look at Blogs and Co. They do a much better system where you can refine the, uh, the restriction of access. What the judge had was there is technology available that allows disablement of access to any IP address in the UK. Full stop. That's what the evidence was. But it isn't. It, but but I, uh, my lord, I disagree that there's a full stop there. Um, not least because um, of the uh, piece of evidence that I've just drawn your attention to about geolocating. Well, it, it, it raises, if I may respectfully say so, a slightly nebulous issue. It doesn't, doesn't provide an answer. No. But, you, but your answer to me appears to be, well, all right, the defendants may have raised it at this stage, but given the nature of the case, um, it was premature to the judge to deal with it. Yes. I, I, I'm, always, always, I'm sorry to interrupt, always assuming that we agree um, with your... Um, analysis of, of BOLAG. I shall refrain from the rest of the name, but you, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, uh, uh, my lord, I, I do of course take on point uh, on board the point that your lordship made uh, about the questions of jurisdiction uh, and the, in the ordinary uh, course, it's al always been the case uh, that it's appropriate to deal with them as and when they arise. But there has to be um, some measure of proportionality. Um, and if such question, if, if this question, um, in my submission, is to be dealt with um, properly at this early stage, it does require that kind of evidence, uh, and that that that's extremely costly um, evidence to to pull together and produce for what, in reality, um, in at the end of the trial, would be a complete non-issue. This, this this argument wouldn't be taken. Seriously. It would be very unlikely that this kind of evidence would be needed at all. Um, because it's been brought up front, um, there's an enormous amount of argument about something which is, um, as a matter of practical reality in litigation, something that is never usually um, argued about. No, but if we could imagine a hypothetical case in which the claim was only for an injunction, and as so that this um, decision would be dispositive of the entire action. Uh, that would slightly change um, the, the complexion of your arguments. Yeah, of, of course, and, and it would, um, it would you, compete. You would then be saying, well, no, 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 let's just decide jurisdiction now, let's go to trial. Um, we can have a proper investigation of this issue Ooh. there, but that, that couldn't be. No, 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 because if, if, if it were 
only about an injunction and whether an injunction should be granted or not, then that does ch that changes the um, proportionality argument completely because it is worth I mean, it, it is appropriate to um, to deal with it um, at an early stage and to deal with it um, in in detail uh, with the benefit of um, evidence from those with technological expertise. Because it would be dispositive. Um, the other point that my um, learned friend makes, um, and this is his fourth point, is that Bolag Supply Smingen needs to be read in the context of the judgment of E Day. Uh, which in turn must be read in the context of the Advocate General's opinion in E-Day. Uh, and then, as you all will have seen um, from Peter Gleiton's argument, um, some reliance is placed on various statements that are made by the Advocate General in his opinion. Uh, and the reason why the defendant says um, Bolags must be read in that context uh, is found in uh, footnote 14 of the defendant's skeleton argument, um, where, where reference is made to authority that show, that says that where the court follows the advocate general's opinion, um, the opinion is a legitimate aid to the judgment. So I accept all of that. I accept that where the court follows the advocate general's opinion, the opinion is a legitimate aid to the judgment. But um, the court um, in Bolag Supply Smingen does not follow the advocate general. Um, opinion, certainly not in its entirety. Um, the Advocate General proposed a test um, of centre of gravity of the dispute, which was a twofold test. One part of it was centre of interests, which Bolag Supply Smingen um, followed, adopted. That's the um, e date um, part of it. Uh, and the second related to the nature of the information, which the Advocate General said um, the information giving rise to the dispute must be expressed in such a way in light of the circumstances surrounding the news item, uh, it will um, attract interest in a particular territory and consequently actively encourages readers to access it. That doesn't find its way anywhere into the judgment of the court. So in my submission, the extent to which this court should be playing reliance on what the Advocate General uh, in Bolag Supply Smingham said um, is limited. Um, first, because the court in Bolag said it's not did not follow the Advocate General's opinion um, itself. Uh, secondly, um, my Lords, because the points relied on by the defendant in that case, um, the, the, points, the points made by the Advocate General, um, are largely factual assertions um, about the current state of the internet um, as it was then. Um, sorry, this is in e I do apologise, this is in E-Date, the Advocate General's opinion in E-Date. Um, those assertions um, are um, they date from March 2011 so that's nearly 11 years ago um, so what is said about the state of the internet and um, the ability of the courts to control it all of those things uh, must be read um, with that very much in mind um, and it is in my submission not appropriate for that reason alone, not just because the Advocate General's opinion in E-Date was not followed, um, to, for this court to place any reliance on it. Um, and I'll give an example um, as to why um, it would um, be inappropriate. If one looks at um, page 218 um, of the authorities uh, bundle, so this is the Advocate General's opinion in E-Date. Uh, and here the Advocate General is de dealing with the opportunity to adapt uh, or confirm the Cheryl case law uh, and you'll see at paragraph 50 uh, an account of the history of Cheryl 
given in the years immediately preceding the expansion of the internet, uh, and then picking it up, picking it up at E, 50E, uh, the practical application of this rule um, was viable at the time when the Chevel judgment was given, having regard, for example, to the number of copies distributed in each member state, information which was easy to verify because it was part of the commercial policy of the media outlets and was the result of voluntary business decisions. However, as those who participated in the hearing in these proceedings acknowledged, there are no reliable criteria for measuring the degree of distribution of a media outlet as such or of its content on the internet. While it is true that the number and origin of hits on a website may be indicative of a particular territorial impact, they are, in any event, sources which do not provide sufficient guarantees for the purposes of establishing conclusively and definitively that unlawful damage has occurred. Well, that may have been um, the view that was taken um, in 2011. That, is not, that does not reflect the, the approach of the courts here um, in this jurisdiction to date. Um, hits on a website, or on a web page more accurately, because an article will appear on a page of a website, are um, the most reliable criteria for determining um, what the readership of a particular um, article has been. Uh, and indeed, um, are a more reliable um, indication of actual readership than distribution of copies distribution of copies is not even the same um, as um, purchase of copies uh, or readership of copies. Um, copies can be distributed and then left uh, unopened and unsold. Um, so, so that, in my submission, is an example uh, that I take from the Advocate General's opinion which demonstrates why uh, it's inappropriate to rely on it uh, as a basis um, for this court uh, to make judgments about what can and cannot be done in terms of controlling access to material on the internet. Uh, and um, in addition, my laws, uh, in my submission, the ubiquity of the internet is not a reason or should not be a reason for limiting um, the number of remedies potentially available to a claimant, um, but is a reason for expanding them. Um, and indeed, that is why, or that is what we see happening in eDate itself um, in the judgment from paragraphs 45 uh, and onwards. And I, I don't propose to take your lordships through them, but it's because of this ubiquity that the extra uh, remedy was added. So this court should be slow to reduce, in my submission, um, the number of remedies um, potentially available. I suppose the, the, the logic of the argument that says you can't get what the judge called an internet injunction if geo-blocking can't do the job for you would apply in any mosaic jurisdiction. Um, but the solution to that is you either sue in the centre of interests if you have one uh, and we don't know that we don't know the position in relation to your client or you sue in the domicile of the public um, that could be the scheme yes is there anything fund fundamentally wrong with that Yes, <coughs> well, if, th th that proceeds on the assumption that there is no way of controlling access um, to a particular article on the internet. Yes, well, which, that's which the hypothesis. Is, which, is, which is not the position. Um, so yes, on that hypothesis, that, that would have to be the answer. In other words, the, the, you, you treat um, this situation in, in, a, in a similar way to the Bolex yeah. But for if, slightly if different there's no reasons. ability to restrict then, then, it, then, yeah. is it, then that is the situation. Well, I think my point is that it, it doesn't, there's no very satisfactory distinction between a situation in which there's no ability to restrict and, and a 
situation in which there isn't an ability to restrict to the territory in question? Because you've, you've always got e extraterritorial effects. Well, as I say, that can be, that can be dealt with, um, if necessary, in the terms of the order. Um, and I said, in my submission, and I'm sorry, I am repeating myself, but in terms of that there is a distinction in terms of degree, um, and that, in my submission, um, goes to arguments about proportionality uh, and goes back to um, the points that I made at the outset about the court's duty to act compatibly with convention rights, because there comes a point where the balance tips so far. Um, so what's the criteria for that balance? One end of the scale, as Bolag supplies in England, universal effects. At the other end of the scale, purely domestic effects. Somewhere in between, there is some necessary extraterritorial effect. Well, if we're talking about jurisdiction, which we are under Act 7, what's the criteria by which you judge whether that is or isn't too much extraterritorial effect? Uh, with it, well, it, in my submission, it's about whether or not it would represent a um, disproportionate interference. So, um, well, so, so in this in this case, of, and, and it must be borne in mind that we're talking about the position at the end of the trial. Um, no, where no, no, it, well, the respect, we aren't. We're deciding whether the English courts have jurisdiction yes. to grant to, this relief, yes. which, if it were the only relief claimed in the action, would be determinative of whether it was allowed to go forward or not. But, but it would necessarily be relief which um, would only well, could uh, could only be available in circumstances where a claimant um, had succeeded. So that, that that must be that must be a part of the of the reasoning. When the when the court is acting is is acting um, in accordance with um, its duties under the convention. It must it must, it must look at the situation. The the the. the what the position would be at the time when that injunction order comes to be made. Yeah, you make, you make the assumptions of yes. on the merits in yes. favour of, yes, of course, yes. in favour of your clients. Yes. yes. But isn't, I mean, jurisdiction, a, a defendant is entitled to say, um, you, you can't sue me here. This court has got no jurisdiction. You must go to somewhere else, Italy, or wherever this chap's centre of interests are. That's the right place to sue, if you want some kind of injunctive relief in relation to the internet. So, I mean, a defendant isn't to be put at risk of something which, on the evidence, um, is going to have extraterritorial effect. Isn't that the, the proposition? Well, no, my lord, and, and also the, 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 the position in this case is that if this court now held that there is no, that there, there is no jurisdiction, this claimant, um, this, this claimant would certainly be debarred from bringing proceedings here because of the operation of Section 8 of the Def Defamation Act, so he would not have any remedy here, even if his centre of interest is I, I don't know what the position is in relation to um, limitation and Italy. So, so his only real option. Yeah, but that's for you to, that's for you to establish. Isn't it? If I, I take the point you made in, in relation to my very first intervention, that what we should be concerned with uh, is what justice can be provided by this court. Yes. But if that's not the right way of looking at it, and looking at how you apply the convention to a question of allocation of jurisdiction between different member states, then uh, it, it may be said, well, an availability of a remedy in another court uh, means that its unavailability in this court doesn't give rise to a breach of any convention right. <coughs> and if that be right, me that it's for the claimant to say there, there isn't in this case a global jurisdiction in which
which I could get the relief, which I'm asking the court to grant in, in, this, in this case. We don't have any evidence about that. We don't know whether under Italian law there would be any difficulty about it. Isn't there? But my lord, it comes back to this, to my position, which is that if this, so this claim, right, in the light of a determination that, that Bolag supplies Lingo says something that is interpreted in, in the way that the judge interprets it, this claim carries on. Um, this court has a continuing duty to act compatibly with convention rights. Uh, and if it makes, you know, if, if the claimant succeeds at the end of the trial, this claimant in this action, um, in this jurisdiction, will be denied a, the right to an effective remedy. In and, this where, and, and where's the breach of the rights if they can be vindicated elsewhere? But surely, my lord, that's an argument that can... Um, that's an argument that can be made in respect of many different types of claim and different types of action. But, but not, where you're applying, sorry, not where you're applying convention rights, it's a question of allocation of jurisdiction rather than substantive rights. But the, but, but the court itself, well, the, co the court itself would need to be satisfied that it was acting compatibly with convention rights. Not acting incompatibly. That was well, yes, sorry, not, or not that, acting that, incompatibly. That, that, that would have probably chosen quite um, advisably. Because the court doesn't have an obligation to ensure that um, this claimant in this action gets everything that he could possibly get. No. It, it has a, a, a duty to avoid um, an interference with his convention rights, which doesn't meet the criteria in whichever qualified article we're talking about. Um, so my lord's point um, is relevant. If if the um, approach, however you arrive at. Is to say, well, this remedy can't be obtained in this jurisdiction in this action. Um, that may not be a breach, may not be incompatible, if the same remedy could be obtained in another action in another jurisdiction. Um, and we're not shown any evidence that it can't. So I go back to um, my original point, um, which is about um, Section Three of the Human Rights Act. Uh, and the duty to, really, to read, if possible, um, legislation in a way that is compatible. But if you're right about that, why, why isn't the decision in Bolex Supplies and Income itself incompatible with uh, the human rights? Because it decides that in a mosaic jurisdiction, there is some interference with Article 8 rights for which the mosaic court can provide no remedy, i.e. a case of indivisible and universal well, that, I mean, that, that, that argument could, could be made, my lord, but in my submission, I don't, well, I don't, need, to go, I don't need to go that far. I don't need to do that. Um, uh, and indeed, I, 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 could, I could quite um, legitimately be saying now, well, we don't need to, um, this court doesn't need to follow Bolag Supply Slingen at all for that reason. But um, I, that, I don't need that in order to get my arguments home. I can say that that court was dealing with something else. Um, and a different kind of application, uh, which is not this, this claimant's application. So it's not, it's not necessary for, you, for me to make that broad submission or fundamental submission about Bolag Supplies Lincoln in order to get my claimant home on, on his application. So I could, I, could, I could make that argument. I could also make the argument um, that in terms of ju jurisdiction, a, a test of better than, uh, the better of the argument um, is, is a test which is in effect a finding on a balance of probability. So what does it mean? But, but these points are all points that are for another day. Well, um, I don't speaking need to for myself, I can see considerable difficulties in saying that uh, Bolag Supplies Lincoln uh, is incompatible with human rights insofar as it restricts the ability to claim global relief in every mosaic jurisdiction. And that raises questions rights of defendants not to face claims for global relief in 28 plus different jurisdictions at the same time. But anyway, you don't, you, you don't say that Bolag's wrong in that respect. No, no. I, I, and, and, and as I said, I don't, I don't need to. I don't. Um, because I, 
because I said that's what it's about. It's about global views, not about jurisdiction specific beliefs. Um, my Lord's coming on to my um, second ground, and that. Uh, Should we just pause there to see how we're doing on time? Yes, I'm, I was about I'm to say. I'm that. very conscious that yes. we've interrupted you so, a lot, but that's one of the no, hazards. Uh, the other. The, so, this is all I have left, <coughs> um, and this is what I've done. So the other the other grounds are going to be dealt with very quickly. Uh, because the, the vast majority of them is either covered, covered in the skeleton or in um, what, I've, what I've said already. Yes. Well, unless Mr. Early tells us otherwise, it seems to me, at any rate, that um, you, you, you need to finish by lunchtime at the yes. latest in order to allocate the time even yes. um, I, imperfectly. Yes, I, I will be. Um, so I'm coming on to the second ground, um, which is what the analysis of uh, Mr. Justice Nicholl in um, Chai. Um, and the defendant rightly acknowledges um, at paragraph 11 of its skeleton um, that the concerns of <coughs> comity, uh, which limited the judge's ability to depart um, at first instance, do not apply here. Um, but in any event, it's asserted that the um, statement of the law um, is correct. Um, my Lords, uh, as you will know from the skeleton argument, um, we say that that is not right. Um, moreover, when one looks at Said itself, um, it's apparent um, that the court in that case was centrally concerned with analysis of the question uh, of centre of interest. Well, it was only concerned with that question, wasn't it? I mean, I would have thought, thought your better point is this is even more distinguishable than both eggs because well, yeah, yeah, it's a centre of interest case. Yes, yes, it's a, this is a centre of interest case, um, and it you read the judgment and the most one can say is that it appears to have been assumed as opposed to have argue, argued or analysed um, that the effects of Bolag Supply Sningham um, was that an injunction preventing publication of online material in a mosaic jurisdiction um, was not available. It, sim it simply wasn't. Um, the issue wasn't addressed or analysed at all um, except where the judge summarises um, the law summarises um, Bolag Supply Sningham uh, and then extracts from that um, that an injunction would not be available. Um, and the judge in my submission, the judge in this, the judge below, um, fell into uh, error uh, in placing reliance on that decision and uh, not identifying uh, it as incorrect and, and to be departed from. Uh, and further, um, placed it, in relying on it, uh, placed reliance on matters which she plainly should not have relied on. Um, first of all, um, an inference which she drew uh, about the reason why the claimant advanced his case on centre of interest so late in the day. She assumed that that must have been because the claimant recognised um, that unless his case was advanced on that basis, his claim for an injunction was bound to fail. There was nothing to support that speculation. Um, no evidence of it in the judgment at all. Um, and even if that was the reason, even if the claimant took that view, that is not of any weight. Um, and in my submission, the judge was also wrong to state, um, sorry, that was at paragraph 80 of her judgment. Um, she was also wrong to state at paragraph 75 um, that Mr. Justice Jay in NAPAG trading um, cited Mr. Justice Nichols' analysis uh, of Bolag Supply Sneeman with approval. Um, what he, in fact, said uh, is set out at paragraph 50 of my skeleton. Um, and I don't need to uh, take you to it, but in short, the parties were agreed as to the position. Uh, and what, Nichol, uh, what Mr. Justice Nichols said uh, was a valuable summary of the law. That was as far as it went. Um, similarly, the case of Kennedy, the Court of Appeal case, um, which is in the authorities bundle, and you'll notice you do not need to turn it up, Tab 15, paragraph 80. Uh, all, that have, all that occurs there uh, is a repetition of the holding in Bolag Supply Sningham. There's no comment, analysis, or anything else about it. Um, so those were not, in my um, submission, uh, proper, um, proper reasons to rely on um, to bolster um, the finding or the determination um, that Bolag Supply Sningham should be interpreted uh, in the way 
uh, that Mr Justice uh, Nicholl did in Syene. Um, my Lords, moving on then to my third ground, um, this is the, um, the judge erred in law uh, in holding that her conclusion that there was no jurisdiction was dispositive of the points about Article 8 and Article 10. Um, I have already covered this um, with you, my Lords, um, but um, I think the, the crucial point is this, um, is, well, first of all, of course, the duty to act compatibly continues throughout, um, and except to the extent that the court could, sorry, duty to not act incompatibly um, continues throughout, except to the extent that the court could not have acted differently. Uh, but fundamentally, there is a prior requirement um, before before that, before the, the, the all legislation should be interpreted so far as possible to be compatible with convention rights. If the court hasn't taken that prior step of ensuring that its decision is compatible, it cannot then, in my submission, properly rely on its own um, failure in that regard to perform its duty as a basis for maintaining it now cannot act other than incompatibly. So if the court has, has not taken that, that what happened in, below was the judge made no assessment or reading um, of. Um, Article 7.2 or Bolag Supplier Singen um, from a rights-based perspective at all. Uh, she determined the point and then said, well, that, that's it. There's nothing now in it um, on an Article 8, Article 10 basis for me to consider. Um, and for the reason I've just identified, because she had failed to take that first step, it was then not right um, to say, because I haven't done that, I now, know, I now can carry on um, without the interplay of those rights going forward. <coughs> a rights-based argument must form part uh, of the approach to the interpretation in the first place. Um, dealing finally, and, and again, this is covered in my skeleton, um, the so-called inevitability of extraterritorial effect. Um, my first point on that, my lords, is that the focus of the court um, should be on the terms of the order. And it's for the defendant, not the court, to decide how, if at all, uh, it is going to comply, and what steps are necessary to comply. Um, as I've already said, this, it's not suggested that this is a case where it would be impossible for the defendant to comply with the order. It is suggested it would be impossible to comply without extraterritorial effect. Yes, but it would still be compliance with the order. It, it's not a case of saying I can't. I, you know, that, it, it is impossible for me to comply. We're making this court is making. <coughs> the point is, I if the terms comply. of the order are made in these terms, in order to comply, I must necessarily do something extraterritorial with extraterritorial effect. But the response to that, my lord, is that. An imperfect relief is better than none at all when one is coming at it from a rights-based perspective. And in terms of that small, that small if, if indeed it be the case, that small extra-territorial ter effect, the court has to look at, um, well, what is the interference with the uh, defendant's Article 10 rights in that case? The court's order, the terms of the order, are not of extraterritorial effect, it's the impact that may be. It would be wrong for the court to make an order that is in terms of extraterritorial effect. Court. But, but not wrong to make it if it can only be complied with, with extraterritorial effect. I find that a surprising proposition, I have to say. Well, no, no, given, my lord. Given that what the court is said, ordering someone to do uh, has to be seen not just in the words of the order, but what that would mean in practice. Yes, but it could mean so. It could mean in practice um, that the defendant just takes the article down. Yes, and that has extraterritorial effect. Yes, but that's that's the defendant's choice. And what we're on is, does it have an alternative choice, which is only to do something?
which doesn't have extraterritorial effect, and that's what the evidence at the moment suggests is absent. Is that, um, I mean, well, and I, I've heard what um, your lordships have said about that, but that runs straight into um, the points that I've made earlier about this properly being, more properly being a matter for um, expert evidence, um, or evidence at least of people with technological uh, knowledge of these things, um, and of it being a matter that should, for proportionality reasons, only be uh, inquired into if and when it becomes necessary to do so, because it's already taken up um, an inordinate amount of the court's time. You'll probably appreciate that my experience of defamation trials is literally nil. Um, if this were a trial, um, presumably evidence would be called, submissions would be made, and in all likelihood the judge will, would say, um, thank you very much, you've heard my submission, I've heard submissions on liability and relief, I'll now go away, I shall hand down judgment. Um, and the judge and the parties wouldn't assume that right. the judge will come back with a judgment and then we'll start applying our minds to whether the injunctive relief which we've been arguing about is, is feasible or practicable because I've done all of that as part of the preparation for the trial won't you? or have I got, got it all wrong? Well, so so um in terms of in terms of how how it works out in practice, uh, and I, uh, I'm conscious that I'm not quite answering your question. So you would have you would obviously have the, you'd have the trial, uh, which would be addressing the substance of the claims, whether serious harm uh, was caused, whether any of the defences um, are made out, and so on, um, and uh, evidence also of um, damage in the sense of um, that can be that can be compensated, so distress and harm of the, of the claimant. Um, and then the judge would go away and write the judgment. Uh, and ordinarily, there would not be evidence about this issue at all, because the judge would make the judgment. And if the judge found against the defendant, um, then the judge would ask for a form of order, um, inclu including an injunction, unless the defendant was able to persuade the judge that it had no intention but in a case such as this, where the comments, sorry, where the statements have remained up, it would have a hard job doing so. Uh, and the reality is that this would that, that, that this would not be argued about at all. The order would be made, um, restraining the defendant from publication in this jurisdiction, and the defendant would go away and um, do whatever it needed to to comply with that order. And and that's the, that's the problem in proportionality terms of this all being front-loaded, because there ends up being a huge argument, which is all very interesting academically, but in practical terms, if, if um, it were put off until later in the day, when the state of the technology could be judged by reference to what it actually is, as opposed to what it was 12, 18 months ago, um, the reality is that that wouldn't really ever happen. And this whole, all of these enormous costs and time um, could be Avoided. All right, thank you. Um, so that concludes my submissions. Um, now, the, there was something, my lord, that you said you wanted. Yes, it's now a good moment to raise my yes, section 12 do. concern. And these are just some musings. Uh, the, the, the various permutations. Uh, su su suppose we were to reach the conclusion that um, the, the respondent's notice point is right. That is to say, you're right on your primary point that BOLAG doesn't rule out an internet injunction, but that as a matter of jurisdiction, not discretion, uh, it only permits an injunction whose effect is solely territorial and that that has to be decided on the evidence now and that that is not possible now. Assume that that's where we end up. I'm not saying we will. Uh, I just 
wonder whether it necessarily follows. The same applies to prevent an order for publication on the website, let's say, under Section 12 of the judgment. Because Section 12 is aimed, or at least as I understand it, primarily aimed at mitigating cost damage. It's therefore aimed at reaching those uh, who uh, have had access uh, in a way that has damaged your client's reputation, on the hypothesis we're, we're, we're talking about. But if there were an order that the English judgment be published on the website, that wouldn't prevent the defendants, would it, saying, this is the judgment of the English court, but it only applies uh, in a rather limited circumstances. Uh, the, we are uh, still entitled publish the material which we maintain is true and is in the public interest to publish in Italy and nothing that the English court has says bears on that at all. Now, that may, that may not be a, a very good example as it were, but it, it, it may be that you or someone could fashion uh, the terms of a, a, a section 12 order for publication on which did have solely domestic mosaic effect, as it were, in at least being targeted at and affecting those who had suffered the domestic damage within this jurisdiction. <coughs> and that, that may be pie in the sky, whatever, but I, th those, were the, those were the musings I had, yeah. which, which suggested that the, the, the answer may not necessarily be the same. Or if it is, it's maybe based on slightly different factors. Well, the and I leave that really for you to think about it and for Mr. Erdley to... I was going to say, I'm in your lordship's about. hands and I don't want to look gift, gift horses in the mouth. Um, but if I may, and if it's maybe that you say I may not, uh, I would um, prefer to let Mr. Erdley deal with that point. Yes, um, it, it, it may be that you'll need to articulate in a rather better way than I have at least the outline how that might work in practice. But, but that, I mean, that, that's what I wanted to raise, and, and I'm perfectly content speaking for myself that you, you deal with it in your private way. Thank you. Uh, unless I can be of any further assistance. No, thank you very much. Why, why don't you make a start, Mr. Erdley? I just answer that first point while it's fresh in my mind. What your Lordship was suggesting, I think, was that Section 12 order could be made requiring publication of a statement which in terms makes clear that the English court is only be looking at publication in England and Wales. No, what, what, I had in, what I had in mind is that all that the Section 12 uh, order would do would be to require publication of the English judgment, full stop. But that might not breach the jurisdictional <coughs> bars uh, if, because of what could also be said, it was essentially only had the domestic effect of mitigating the damage from the, from the English publication. <coughs> that's, that's, yes. the, that's the hypothesis. Yeah, yes, I, I, I see. Well, we, we say that runs into exactly the same jurisdictional problem uh, as the injunction. Uh, and I say that for this reason. As you rightly said, the Section 12 order is aimed at remedying the damage that has been caused, which is the subject of the action. Well, that damage, in this case, is it's damaged the client's reputation in the eyes of readers in England and Wales. And it, it, it is that that must be that rectified. An order that inevitably means that uh, something is published to people outside England and Wales, at least to the extent of the rest of the UK, is an order requiring the defendant to do something uh, uh, beyond the jurisdiction of the court if you accept my principal submissions. So there's an excess of jurisdiction in a positive injunctive order like that, just as there is in a negative injunctive but, but, order. But when we talk about excess of jurisdiction, we're meaning subject matter jurisdiction. There's nothing that there's, there's personal jurisdiction. So to require a defendant to, to 
do something outside the jurisdiction is not itself objectionable. The question is whether what, what, what is ordered to be done has such extraterritorial reach as to be inconsistent with the relief that can be granted in a mosaic claim. Yes, and, and we would say it, 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 it would have that extraterritorial effect. And we're, not talk, no, no, we're, not, we're, not, we're not on geo-blocking or anything like that now. We're on what, what, what could be said on the website in addition to publication of the judgment. Yes, but in order to publish the judgment, in the in, where the courts assume jurisdiction only in relation to publication in England and Wales, I would say that uh, the court is limited then only to make a positive order in respect of England and Wales as well. I, I say there's no distinction between a negative injunction, you must not publish outside England and Wales, and a positive injunction, you must publish a tracy of the judgment within England and Wales. The result is that can't be complied with that publishes more widely, at least in, in, in the UK as a whole. But then, in my judgment, it comes up against exactly the same that sort of objection. What, what, what's, the, what's the effect of publishing more widely? We're not comparing like with like. If you have an injunction <coughs> which has extraterritorial reach, it prevents something happening abroad. If you have publication of an English judgment mm -hmm. which reaches an international audience, what is what is objectionable about well, well, that? It, if it's made clear that all the English judgment does is what it does, it, it, because uh, it, it, it's an interference with the defendant's Article Ten rights, both to stop them from publishing something and to make them publish something, uh, and, and to make the uh, defendant publish to people it doesn't want to publish to outside the jurisdiction, but would be objectionable on the same grounds as stopping them publish uh, to people outside the jurisdiction in England and Wales. Well, well, we're not talking about publishing this. The same thing. One is one is publication of the ex hypothesis defamatory material. The other is publication of an English court judgment, making the findings that it does. Yes, but uh, I mean, I can't speak for what my clients would do in that situation. But it's non nonetheless an order requiring them to publish something, not not, not, not not suggesting the court can't publish it, but it would be a positive order on these defendants to publish something which they may not wish to publish. And of course, that can be uh, ordered in respect of England and Wales if its only effect was to require publication in England and Wales. If I'm right about the jurisdiction point, and I'll develop this afternoon, but then exactly the same objection applies to uh, uh, an order that would, in fact, uh, require publication elsewhere in the world uh, as an order which prohibits the defendant publishing something it wishes to publish outside England and Wales and the rest of the world. So, so that's, that's the reason I say there's no real distinction. Um, there is, of course, possibility for the Section 12 order to require uh, direct publication by email to known subscribers, for example. Uh, we, we, there, there, there's no difference between my, my learned friend and myself on, on that. Uh, and that is one of the ways in which uh, the, the claimant's rights could um, uh, be vindicated in this case without overstepping the jurisdictional bounds. Uh, certainly, claim couldn't object to that. The publication on the website, we say, is different. Perhaps that is a convenient moment. Thank you. Two o'clock.